Thank you. Um, it's probably quite fitting that after those, those excellent presentations from real life, giving case <laughs> studies, etc., I'm going back to what Steve started out on. And that's the report that's being launched today, the Leaping and Learning Report. I must say that um, in DFID, we are really proud of having decided to fund this work. When Agriculture for Impact came to us with the idea about <coughs> roughly two years ago, um, we, we were grappling with the same problem. We know 500 million smallholders in the world, roughly two, mil two billion people living off or on smallholder farms, and at the same time, um, we have a huge number of these people who are poor. But you see people, well, some, sometimes it's the productivity that's lacking, so they lack um, access to input markets. Sometimes it's output markets. I mean, traveling in Africa, I've seen the best production in some places I can imagine, but rotten infrastructure, no access to market, no storage facilities, and everything is rotting in the field. So um, we have the whole range. And at the same time, we also thought there are what I always call islands of success, where you have a program that's really working well, small, maybe a couple thousand smallholders, most of them um, are working very closely with either government extension or private sector or an NGO or ideally a group of all three. And uh, they are successful. But then what happens? It's not scaled. The large majority of farmers that need support, that need the linkages to the various types of markets, don't enjoy um, participation in those islands of success. Again, at the same time, we looked at the research and what's out there, and a lot of it is already available. It's not rocket science, what is needed under specific circumstances. And uh, I think that Agriculture for Impact and ODI have done a marvelous job at distilling from existing research what needs to be done. Some of those lessons are not so easy to learn. For example, Steve, you mentioned donors. Donors have to be more patient. Donors have to be um, able to accept failure. Well, the, all of that is not very easy, but we're trying hard, and uh, this report will certainly help us to be realistic in our approach. Um, so I hope that it will go a long way in terms of not doing new research where what needs to be done is already out there, but where this report will help um, the various stakeholders to take things to scale that have been shown to be working. So um, that, that's, a, that's a great thing. Um, DFID, now, we are doing a lot on agriculture. We're also working with smallholders a lot. and. If I may say, probably we are spreading the risk a little by investing in a lot of things. Um, quite a few of the programs are very or largely successful. We have some failures and we try to learn from them. We're also spending a lot of money um, on, on agriculture. <laughs> if you remember the 2009, that was G8 again, the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative commitment. We have actually, I think, overspent in the less than three years. We spent 1.2 billion pounds on agriculture and food security programs with a larger share on supporting smallholders, both productivity and linkages to markets. We have a whole range of country programs that either support smallholders directly, that help those who might not quite make it and end up being not the winners but the losers of agriculture with social protection and ideally um, a pathway out of agriculture if they so wish. Um, we have direct nutrition in the interventions. A lot of what we call the market, uh, making markets work for the poor programming works with smallholders. Um, and uh, we are also working on securing tenure la land tenure rights for citizens, and, and that mostly includes smallholders, and specifically in Africa, where 80 to 90 percent of the land is still under customary law. Um, we're also working in extreme poverty eradication programs, and mostly, um, even when households have diversified their activities, their main income source is, for better or for worse, smallholder agriculture. Um, we also have a number of regional programs, and I'm happy to say that some of our funding has really helped 
the cutout process to make progress in terms of national action plans, in terms of developing strategies, and starting to implement them. And we have what this report also <laughs> suggested, a, ri a range of challenge funds, where we are just looking for the best solutions and and are seeing what works and what doesn't work. So most of you will be familiar with the um, AECF, the Afri Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund, um, where we are also trying to link smallholders into value chains, opening up markets, helping them to be better established. Um, we're spending, I think by now, um, roughly 70 million pounds per year on agricultural research that's in part development of new vaccines, new um, more climate resilient crop varieties, but also um, research into processes that have to happen for, for poor people to help, help poor people to work their way out of poverty. Um, and last but not least, we are funding quite a range of uh, multilateral programs, specifically on smallholders. We mention, we like to mention um, the adaptation of smallholder program that we're funding through IFAT, um, ASAP, where we are targeting six million women and men farmers in a range of countries to practice an agriculture that is going to be more climate resilient. Um, but we're not only funding things, we're also trying to help um, come up with better ways to assess people's situation so that programs can be better targeted and to measure the impact better. I mean, um, most of you who are familiar with DFID will know that we have really, really focused in the last few years on, on better measurements, on better monitoring, and ideally learning from what we're monitoring, not just doing the M&E as one of the activities in a program, but distilling the lessons and feeding them back into the loop of, of how new programs can be designed. Um, we are also focusing increasingly on policy engagement that can be catalytic and strategically important to help smallholders. I already mentioned um, land tenure, we are focusing on um, giving a boost to the implementation of the voluntary guidelines on um, governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forests through the G8, and we hope that that is going to take on larger proportions. Um, and with more secure tenure rights, I think there are some statistics that say that smallholders can increase their productivity and income by up to 40% just by the fact of having more secure tenure rights of the land that they farm. We're also engaging actively in the ongoing CFS process on, uh, for, for consultation on the emerging principles for responsible agricultural investment because more investment is needed and it's needed, the right investment is needed and it needs to be responsible and economically and so socially sustainable. Um, we are also working with other governments department department, you may know, at least those of you who live in the UK, that the Foreign Office is working on a um, strategy for businesses and human rights that will implement the UN guiding principles for business and human rights that is forthcoming. And we will also have um, amended, for UK companies, UK-based companies, amended reporting regulations later in the year that will be published by BIS that will also capture risks and impacts of certain types of investments better. So I think all of that is what we mostly call the enabling environment, but it's essential for smallholders to thrive and also to thrive in the future. Um, that said, um, lots of other stakeholders are also doing their share, and uh, I think it is possible to eradicate poverty and to make make smallholders more of a proactive and successful contributor to national and global food security within a lifetime. Um, but still, more needs to be done. And uh, I think you will agree with me that while we are discussing smallholders, we are always, I, at least personally, I still have in mind a man. And that's wrong. Because the majority <coughs> of people living off and on smallholder farms doing the work are women. And I think we need to really think much more, and not just talk more, we talk a lot about genderizing programs, but we need to do this more, and we need to do this better. Also there, there are good lessons already, how we can um, ensure that, that women benefit more from agriculture, not just as laborers or as workers on their own farm, 
but along the whole value chain. And as DFID, we always strive to ideally see women at some point as agri successful agricultural entrepreneurs along the whole agricultural value chain. Um, so all of this um, would hopefully lead to a situation where we have at a minimum a good enough enabling <coughs> environment and where the major elephant traps that um, Steve has mentioned are out of the way and probably even a little bit more. Um, I think in order to be successful in this, it's, would, it's not helpful to continue an over, overly ideological debate that we sometimes encounter. Is it small farms versus large farms? Or is it public investment versus private investment? That's not the question. I think we believe in DFID that both small and large agricultural investors have their role to play. And uh, we also believe that public and private investment need to come together to maximize. There are some things that the private sector can do better, should do better, and, and, and should be supported to do well. But that also requires that certain public investments have happened for private investments to, to thrive. Um, and there's also a role where that we think civil society actors play best, and that's usually facilitation, linking into local communities, and, and making, making all of this a rounded whole so that we don't have a situation where, as I've seen it sometimes, public and or private investors are constantly talking past the realities of people <coughs> on the ground. So ideally, this is some, an endeavor that, that requires um, these various stakeholders to work together and to work together with less ideology but a, and a lot of realism and pragmatism towards this same objective. And uh, I think we're ultimately leaping and learning for an objective that's outside our own interests. So thank you very much. Thank you, Aris.